losing his time. Oh, you thought I was talking about Dustin Hoffman, huh? Was made nervous as a career. I have a special thing here for you tonight. You know, one of the great myths in America is that everything's changed, right? You think that's not a myth. You think it's the truth, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you. I mean, it depends on how, what you, how you define change. There have been some infinitesimal technical changes. But man himself has not changed. He remains the same simple walking around basic slob that he always was. And you know, you can see this, by the way. You know, you know there's a, there, one of the great myths is the law and order myth. You know, that things are worse now. That people are rottener to each other than they used to be, right? Oh, you hear this all the time. Oh, you hear people saying things like, uh, Oh, yes, when I was a boy, people were, people were much more concerned over each other. And you could walk out of your house and leave the key just right there. And never lock your door, and you could walk through Central Park. Oh, come on. Are you kidding? As a matter of fact, uh, well, the great, I just, uh, I'm looking, the reason I'm reminded is I'm looking at a, uh, an example, classic example that nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed about our world is that we have bigger PR about ourselves. We're constantly, you know, it's what they call self-appraisal. All right, uh, you know, to look at man. But nevertheless, uh, what have I got here? I have the 1897 Sears Roebuck catalog. Hey, did you hear that? I'll repeat that for those of you that were talking and had potatoes in your ears at the time. I have the 1897 Sears Roebuck catalog. Now, that's a long time ago. That's that's a long time ago. And yet it's only a, a tiny ticket of thing there. Historically, 1897 is practically yesterday, historically. But uh, as far as uh, a man's lifetime is concerned, that is eons ago. So you can measure time two ways. You can measure time the historical time, or you can measure it the personal time. In fact, by personal time, last week can be uh, eons ago to a lot of people. Whereas uh, to historians, uh, 1897 is, uh, you know, a small sneeze in the sinus cavities of existence. <laughs> you like that? Huh? You just don't get that kind of stuff from Johnny Carson. No, don't hold your breath. You won't either. Carson pulled that one out. He'd look around and say, who wrote that? But by the way, when he gets a big laugh, he never says, who wrote that? No way. I only take credit for the good things. The bad things always blame on the administration. Whatever the administration is, even if it's your own administration, you blame it on the guy in the other department. So anyway, yeah, to give you an idea how law and order has progressed since 1897, in the 1897 Sears Roebuck catalog, on page, uh, well, they didn't number their pages in those days. Interestingly enough, no, nope, no page numbers. Interesting, but they they have sections, you know, departments. Uh, so you just look in the various departments, and the departments are marked. So it's okay. They weren't that dumb. They didn't. They had invented numbers at that point. It may surprise you to know that people in those days could actually add them, and subtract them, and they could actually divide. They did not need a pocket instant Texas Instrument calculator to perform the simplest functions which your average cluck needs today. However, they, they could do all those things. You'd be surprised they even, they even read things. Why, do you realize in those days, in 1897, Herman Melville was just a contemporary best-selling author? Oh, sure, he wasn't a classic. He was just, uh, hey, you read that new bestseller? Why, your average man today couldn't get past the second page of uh, Herman Melville with all those big words. <laughs> well, you know, with, and there's no slides come with it either. There's no cassette come along with Moby Dick there. However, uh, on, on this particular page, now I read to you to let you know, 18, it's fascinating to read this thing. Though. It really is. 1897 Sears Roebuck. Here it is down at the bottom of the page. It says in big headline, costs you only 
one dollar and sixty eight cents. One sixty eight. And underneath it it says to save your life. The whole headline reads cost you only a dollar sixty eight to save your life. And what are they selling? Well, double action, automatic, police thirty eight caliber revolver. <laughs> Those were the good old days when people were nice to each other. All right. <laughs> Had to carry a Roscoe around. And it says, uh, to save your life. Well, uh, that's kind of a nice price, though. Buck sixty-eight for a thirty-eight caliber double-action police nickel-plated revolver. And it says, with uh, with beautiful carved hard rubber ha uh, handles. And there it is, sitting right there. It says, our gun department. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, by the way, if you wanted to buy a dozen of them, you can get a dozen for 20 bucks. I mean, in case you want to outfit the whole family. So a dollar sixty-eight to save your life. Now, does that sound a little bit like things have changed? I mean, obviously, there were perils on the street in uh, 1897. You want to hear some of their other goodies they have here? Well, all right. There's all kinds of goodies. Of course, there's the average things, you know, the, the funny stuff. Uh, for example, you could buy a complete, easy-to-assemble, stylish, beautifully carpentered, and beautifully engineered outhouse. Mm -hmm. Came in a kit. You can order it. You know, have a happy time with the whole family putting together the john. And then you trucked it out in the backyard. And, of course, there must have been some kind of a ceremony when they used it the first time. You know, they... Yeah, uh, it was very exciting. And uh, watches were very big in those days, great big gold watches. And I'm talking about, you know, really fancy looking with 14 carat watches. Now that's, you know, that's pretty good uh, great gold, isn't it? 14 carat? I don't know about carats. Is that fairly reasonably good? Well, let's say it's better than uh, uh, DuPont plastic, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, you could get yourself a 14 carat, 17 jewel Ladies' watch with a cover on it. You know, with, it had uh, it had enameled, uh, beautiful enameled, uh, looks like uh, uh, lilacs and stuff on it. That's a genuine 14 karat watch. It's the best they have. Nine dollar and ninety cents. Gold, yes, of course, gold. It's just 14 karat gold. Now their highest quality, gold filled. Now what's that? Is that better? No? Okay. All right, I won't even bother you with that. I mean, being so uh, snobbish. Uh, how about 10 carat? How's that? Is any good? No, that's so-so. How about a 20-year gold-filled 14 carat watch? 20-year guarantee on it. That's longer than most people lived in those days. <laughs> that one comes for 775. So uh, you want to hear some more of the other stuff? Great, great stuff they have. Boy, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could get one of everything that's in this catalog? Why, you would have the greatest antique shop for miles around. For example, here's some of the kind of stuff you would have, for example. All right. Uh, you would have Queen Victoria presentation plated silverware. Elegant Fine white silver metal. What's that sell for? Well, you get the entire set for uh, it's uh, 18 pieces, including creamers, silver teapot, a silver tray. You get a set of silver spoons, forks, knives, the whole business. Seventeen dollars and eighty-seven cents. The whole bit in a walnut case, by the way. <laughs> Today, you couldn't get the walnut case for that. Are you kidding? Walnut? All right. Uh, so you see, things have improved as we've lived along. You want to see some of their other things? Hey, by the way, back in those days, in 1897, it was the heyday of the lodge. The, you know, the lodge, the, uh, uh, the elks and all that kind of stuff. And they have page after page of lodge emblems, but lodges that you never heard of, because many of them have disappeared since those days. You want to hear some of the great lodges here? All right, here's one for you uh, that uh, you perhaps... Uh, here's the AOF. You want the AOF? 
Well, there are still some of those around. That's the American Odd Fellows. You've heard of that lodge. How about this one? Have you ever heard of the Epworth League? The Epworth League. You can get a beautiful gold and silver enameled Epworth League pin for 40 cents. No, I don't know whether... <laughs> How about uh, the Eastern Star? You know what that is. Okay, you can get beautiful Eastern Star pins. And uh, how about the KFP? Knights of Pythias. Correct them all. Right, and they have page after page of these fantastic things. They are in all kinds of gold and enamel. And uh, by the way, if you're an elk, you can buy a uh, you know, the Sons of the Desert are right here. Yes, crossed scimitar blades uh, surmounted by a silver turban. Now, for those of you who know about the Sons of the Desert, great outfit, Sons of the Desert. That's only 37 cents for a solid gold Sons of the Desert pin. Here's one here for you, a uh, Christian Endeavor, uh, the Catholic MB Association. What's that one? I don't know about that one. Catholic MB Association. And here's one for you, IOP. Now, that's a rare one. <laughs> that's the... Uh, International Order of Pharmacists. And you had a symbolic mortar and pestle. And you could have it made in the form of cufflinks. Yes, they, well, that was an organization, apparently. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how about this one? I've never heard of this one. S-O-V. Uh, S-O-V. Well, that has disappeared, as far as I know. It was... It was a lodge called Sons of Veterans. Now, what veterans were they talking about? 1897, gang. That's correct. Civil War. Uh, so the Civil War, let's see, in 1897. Civil War ended in uh, 64. Figure it out. That's 35 years, give or take a few years past. So there were plenty of Civil War guys around. At that time, and I'm sure they had a uh, an organization too. What was their organization called? It's right here. You can you can join it. No, Civil War veterans. You're just uh, you're you're flailing there. They had better names than that. <laughs> but uh, how about this one? How about the Daughters of Rebecca? The Daughters of Rebecca. Uh, how about this one? Uh, oh, this is a, here's an elegant one. It's the WCTU. You can get it in silver, platinum, or gold. And what is that? The Women's Christian Temperance Union. And it's got a symbolic hammer smashing a symbolic stein. <laughs> it gets right there, yeah. Oh, wow. And now we're back again with the 1897. Oh, I, I better give credit. This is the 1897 Sears Roebuck catalog, and it's an absolute reprint. It's beautiful. And uh, this was sent to me, and it's uh, it was republished by an outfit, and this is uh, just by way of giving it a a uh, the proper credit, Chelsea House. And incidentally, the uh, the preface to it is by an old friend of mine, S. J. Perlman, writes the uh, preface to it, and uh, he starts out by saying this: If all the records for the 1890s should be lost, a scholar in the remote future who stumbled upon this book could obtain a fairly accurate description of American life during the last decade of the 19th century. And uh, S.J., he doesn't say that. That's the uh, professor who, you know, is commenting on this, Fred L. Israel. Uh, his, uh, his opening uh, line, S.J.'s opening line, says, Though never less than awe-inspiring, the Sears catalog exercised an effect on me not unlike Marcel Proust's Madeleine and Lime Flower Tea, whole, whole eras of my remote youth leap back into focus as I thumb through its pages. <laughs> there was, for example, the instrument numbered number 14954 and known as Brown and Sharp's latest pattern, Hair Clipper. It is a renowned machine tool concern in Providence, Rhode Island. He says he worked there in the summer of 1919 for what is known as a pittance. However, uh, 
looking at this here here for example they have a tremendous collection in this magazine show you how our society has changed can you imagine picking up the Sears catalog in 1976 and there are page after page of personal revolvers for personal protection and I don't mean just a couple page after page and it's amazing how cheap they were you could really get a uh, you could really pick yourself up a Roscoe for practically nothing. Here, for example, here uh, here's the Defender 32, and listen to this: rubber handle, five shot, 32 caliber rim fire, full nickel plated, zeroed in sights, uh, weight 10 ounces, excellently balanced rifled barrel, a top flight professional instrument, one dollar and twenty cents. Life was cheap in 1897. Certainly was. Uh, armaments were cheap. Yeah, and you could get some really elegant one. Here's one now. I'll show you one right here now. That, that I saw recently in Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch, if you've ever gone up to their seventh floor up there, it's a fascinating section of it, Abercrombie. They have, uh, yes, they have, uh, rare collector's arms up there. Uh, that's the section you've never been in. They have uh, rare, they have rare uh, guns. They have, for example, the kind of uh, muzzle loader guns that were used by, uh, say, for example, uh, uh, the oh, the Kurds. You've seen pictures of uh, of Errol Flynn fighting the desert uh, wars, and so here you see these guys galloping with these long rifles. Well, they have some of those there. The real thing, not models. The real thing. They have, uh, they have stuff from uh, from the, the wars. You can pick yourself up a, a collector's item, a 1896 Boer War, uh, going all the way back to the earliest days. But here is a specific one that I saw. There was a famous gun called Colt's Single Action Army and Frontier Revolver. Now that was a that was the one you always see Glenn Ford. Uh, when Glenn Ford is wearing the uh, uh, the Union uniform, you know, and he's not not Civil War, but when Glenn Ford is wearing his his Federal Troop uniform, you know, with the gold stripe, and he's got the Seventh Cavalry flag flying, well, he carried a Colt single action Army revolver. Now, if you can get one of those today on the collector's item, you you'll have to mortgage your house. <laughs> I mean, to start with, they're very rare, and it's an elegant looking revolver. However, in 1897. That revolver sold in Sears for $12.96. And by the way, you've got two gross of ammunition with it and a complete cleaning kit and a leather and wood carrying case and a holster. So you were ready to go out and clean up the bad guys. No problem, just 12 bucks. And uh, they... Uh, <laughs> Uh, all kinds of uh, great stuff is in this catalog, if you're curious about it. That, but these are endless pages of, uh, of guns and uh, repeating rifles. And they sold ammunition just the way today Sears will sell, for example, uh, uh, old uh, wallpaper. Look at the pictures of the ammunition. Thousands of bullets are pictured on their pages of all types, extra long, imported Forty eighty five dollared. You know what a forty eighty five is? That's an elephant gun. That's a big, big cartridge. <laughs> oh, you fire a forty eighty five, and a gun that fires a forty eighty five usually comes with wheels on it. I mean, you don't just fire that thing off. Incidentally, here's a great little thing. You can get yourself a grass suit, a complete haystack that you hook on yourself so that you can fool the ducks. And there it is. Yeah, there is a whole suit. And it, 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 it looks like a little haystack. It shows a guy's feet sticking out of it. That's kind of nice. I like that. And decoys. You know that the collecting of decoys is a big new hobby. I'm talking about wooden, hand-carved decoys that are carved and beautifully painted, looking like the duck. And uh, they're, they're quite expensive if you get the really good ones. Sometimes a, a decoy will run you, oh, for a very... A commonplace decoy, a late model decoy, they may go from as low as $25 to as high for the more rarer ones from the 19th century, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, they may go as four or $500 for a really good decoy, because these are works of art. Uh, somebody carved a duck. 
uh, and uh, he carved it beautifully. Well, here in Sears, these are handmade decoys, hand carved from sound white cedar. They are. Uh, it says that they are uh, beautifully balanced and will float. It says they they absolute true reproductions of the ducks. And you can get mallards, you can get canvas backs, redheads, blue bill, teal, all kinds of ducks. And if I told you how much they were, you would get sick. One dollar and ninety seven cents a dozen. <laughs> a dozen. Now, can you imagine the poor guy, how much he must have made? The guy that carved each one of those. Remember, these are a dollar ninety-seven a dozen sold through Sears. So, how much do you think the carver got when he sold them to Sears for resale? Probably about a dollar a dozen, something like that. I would guess, give or take uh, ten cents one way or the other. So uh, times have changed, uh, and so when you hear old guys uh, complaining, you know, say, "Hi, ah, hi, George. I remember the days when a dollar was a dollar." Well, apparently, looking at this catalog, there was a time when a dollar was a dollar. And uh, have you heard the latest rumor about the dollar, by the way? Seriously. And now that we're on that subject, there has been a rumor around that, that the dollar has decreased in value. Actually, you know, today practically everything is uh, is, is a dollar. You walk in and, uh, you know, you buy a hamburger, it's a dollar, uh, you, you know, or better. Uh, so whatever it is, so the the rumor is that they're going to bring out a dollar metal dollar, you know, a, a dollar a dollar coin, a silver. This won't be silver; it'll be a coin, a dollar coin. Now you you hear that and you say, oh well, gee, that's interesting. Do you know what that's going to do though? Every slot machine in the country will suddenly overnight become a dollar slot machine. See, as it is now, you walk up to a Coke machine or, you know, a machine that sells Pepsi or something like that, and about the biggest coin that they ever ask for is a quarter, maybe 35 cents a quarter at a time, because it would be very difficult for them to have a dollar machine, you see, at this point, because a dollar doesn't. So when they bring out that dollar, boy, forget your, let's stop and pick up a quick Coke at the machine there. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? They're bringing it out. Yeah, that's that's the whole point of the the dollar, the dollar coin. So uh, here's here's some of the other stuff here. Wild stuff in this thing, though. That you uh, and and a lot of stuff looks absolutely uh, looks absolutely normal. Now shirts, for example. Now how much do you think shirts would go for in 1897? That's something that we wear. People wear shirts today, and uh, these are. Uh, all kinds of shirts. There's flowered shirts. There's shirts uh, with prints imported. Percales. Is that a shirt? You've heard of a percale? That's fine cotton, right? All right. Here's a shirt. Imported percale. It says, elegantly tailored, full-size men's shirts. One of our better French percales. Colors and fine custom design, including uh, cuffs. And, of course, in those days, they had a snap-on collar. It says, including four collars in contrasting, elegantly selected shades. So if you had a, uh, a dark green shirt, you could have a light green collar, and really elegant, and the cuffs and all that. Uh, three for two sixty-five, or $0.96 cents a piece for a shirt. Okay? That's not bad, is it? Not bad at all. Why don't you write to Sears and order some? <laughs> so I'm ordering from the catalog here. <laughs> and, uh, here's, here's another one now. Here's... Here's men's full-length Irish turtleneck sweaters. Now, these are exactly the kind they sell today, you know, the high turtleneck. It says, imported from Ireland, 100% fine Irish wool. Ready for this one? It says, men's sizes, boys' sizes available at a reduced price. So these are fine hand-knit. These are hand-knit Irish sweaters. Okay. Ninety-three cents each. Yep, ninety-three. Well, now wait a minute. Let's be honest, though. Just let's 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 be perfectly frank. In eighteen ninety-seven, uh, I would imagine that the average working man earned probably around nine to ten dollars a week. So, a ninety-seven cent uh, sweater is one tenth of his weekly salary. Now, if you take one tenth of your weekly salary. 
just take, in your mind, just think of your weekly salary and take a tenth of it. Well, that uh, <laughs> that would be about what he paid for that uh, that sweater. So, you know, these these uh, prices are really, uh, uh, in a sense, very, uh, very deceptive. You read this and you say, oh, wow, you know, wowee, were things cheap in those days? Well, remember also that a guy, when he worked, always worked in 1897, always, without exception, six days a week. The 40-hour week was 30 years away, <laughs> or better. And he worked endless numbers of hours, so figure out the hourly pay. And uh, this guy probably worked a half a day just to even think of getting a sweater like that, even though it was uh, fairly cheap. So you gotta you got to be a little intelligent about it. Now, here, 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 for example... Is a great uh, a great page stuff that you never see again. It's completely of that period. You would never see it now. They have a complete page, beautiful page, of our best quality silk watch fobs. I haven't seen a watch fob except in a museum. You know what a watch fob is? It's a fob that you attach to a watch. So you put the watch in your vest pocket, see, and they have this great elegant fob. And one of their really top models of their elegant fob is for members of the Elks Club, the Elks Lodge. It says, with, an, with a genuine Elks tooth mounted in full gold, a uh, 22 karat gold, well, a tooth. It's a tooth, you know. The, uh, the Elks uh, have this tooth that hangs down. And so you could have a tooth that hangs down from you. I, I remember one thing about that, uh, looking at this. My grandfather, I had a grandfather that was, when he passed on, was in his 90s. And my grandfather had this chain across the front of his vest. And attached to his chain was this big, uh, what's the one, what's the lodge, let's see if you know it, that has a T-square on it. A T-square, it's a lodge with a T-square. What lodge is that? There you go, right. <laughs> And he always had this gold T-square hanging down, and I'd look at that thing, and it had lo looked like a little ruler, you know. It had little markings on it. And uh, I used to say, what is that? And he'd say, yeah, well, you'll understand that when you're older. Now, how about fountain pens? Fountain pens were new in 1897, and they were a sensational smash discovery, a pen that carried its own ink around. And, uh, of course, those were really exciting. It says, uh, newest discovery in... Uh, in writing materials. It says, this new invention has completely revolutionized office work, a pen that carries its own ink. Well, of course, in those, you know, this was back in the Scrooge days. Scrooge was at work in 1897. And you, you know, old Bob Cratchit sitting there scratching away with a pen, see? Well, if you, if you really wanted to modernize your office, you've got a pen that had ink right in it. What was that? 26 cents. For the newest discovery, bring it up, 1897 series. You've been listening to Gene Shepard, humorist, author, and recipient of the Mark Twain Award for 1976.